can we do anything about it? My two guests think we can. They say that if anybody should own the politicians, we the people should. Dan Cantor is a former community and union organizer who's executive director of the Working Families Party. That's a third party that began in New York State and has now spread to five others. Since its launch 15 years ago, he helped lead the party's efforts to elect progressive candidates throughout the state and worked to increase New York's minimum wage and raise taxes on the rich. Jonathan Soros is one of those who would pay more. He's a lawyer, investor, and philanthropist working on economic change and social goods a senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, exploring the role of corporations in society, and co-founder of the super PAC, Friends of Democracy, which aims to counter the influence of money in politics. An irony we'll discuss later. Dan and Jonathan are on the front lines of the fight to make New York State a national model for the public financing of political campaigns. Welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Here. What an odd couple you are. Jonathan, you're a lawyer, a man of means, you're active in finance, uh, among other things. Daniel, you were a street fighter who cut your teeth organizing labor. In fact, New York Magazine once called you the very model of a grassroots political boss. What is, briefly, the Working Families Party? So Working Families is a political party organized under the laws of New York, more or less in, a, in an alliance uh, with the Democrats. We try to yank the Democrats in what we think to be a sensible, humane, progressive direction. Uh, we get about 5% of the vote statewide, but in some target races, we can get as much as 15, 20, 22%. Who funds you? So it's a variety of individual donors. We, raise, we do a lot of door knocking. That's about 25% of our donations. Unions, individuals, uh, you know, we scuffle. We do fundraising events. Uh, it's not a high donor operation, but we, uh, we try to keep, you know, keep the doors open. So Jonathan, what do you to this rabble rouser? Uh, well, Dan and I first worked together uh, probably about a decade ago as we were uh, taking on the question of Rockefeller drug laws in New York State. Um, and then he came back to me uh, you know, a little over a year ago. Uh, Dan's been working as part of a terrific coalition of groups, the New York Fair Elections Coalition, that have been promoting campaign finance reform for a number of years in New York State. He knew that I had a lot of interest in this issue for a long time. Um, and so we've well, been, where, did, where did that interest come from? My first real job out of college, uh, I ended up spending almost two months in Moldova, the Republic of Moldova, working with a USAID-funded foundation uh, dealing with their first ever parliamentary elections. Uh, I was there for on the ground for two months. That was my first taste of really how rules matter uh, in mm -hmm. the way that elections are conducted. Um, and how sometimes the unwritten rules matter too. The unwritten uh, rules, such as well, so there were there weren't great rules about campaign finance in Moldova. Uh, you know, the, their first ever elections, uh, there was uh, you know a lot of use of state funds uh, in in electioneering. Um, folks who were sitting in the parliament were uh, in the existing parliament were running around in state cars uh, doing their campaigning. This has been a communist governed country. It's a communist governed country. Yeah. Um, and then I had a great, I had a great uh, teacher in law school, Lonnie Guineer, uh, who really opened my eyes to, to a number of issues related to democratic process, and it's been a set of issues that I've cared about ever since. So what are you after in New York State? So we're after a comprehensive uh, system of campaign finance reform. Uh, I got involved in this really actively after Citizens United on the belief that there is still, despite the Supreme Court's rulings, uh, that there is a suite of reforms that would be transformative in the way that money flows in and around politics. And that's now on the table uh, in New York State. Uh, it starts with disclosure, obviously, but it really focuses around wh what we're calling citizen funding, a form of public financing that allows candidates the opportunity, gives them the option uh, to run for public office without dependence on large contributions and independent expenditures. Uh, that's, that's really what we're, uh, what we're seeking to achieve. I mean, I, I think his point about rules is really worth underlining, right? Better rules produce better outcomes, whether it's in uh, elections or, for that matter, in the finance industry. There's economic inequality. You've talked a lot about that on this show over the years. Uh, but there's also political inequality. And this effort is an attempt to deal with at least that second one a little bit. But if you deal with political inequality, we have a system that should be one person, one vote, not one dollar, one vote, you'll, you'll affect uh, other things besides the elections themselves. The, the, uh, we have a non-virtuous system right now in which wealth gets power, uses the power to increase its wealth. You know, Gustav Brandeis' famous comment about how you can have uh, great concentrations of wealth 
or you can have a democracy, but you can't have both. So we, we're at a, at a moment in the society, it seems to us, which we have to make a decision. Uh, and we need to create a system that voters themselves will have more confidence in because right now when you knock on doors, people are, they're pretty cynical that things can change. Isn't the governor of New York, Governor Cuomo, on your side? Listen to what he said in his State of the State speech in January. We must enact campaign finance reform because people believe that campaigns are financed by someone else at exorbitant rates. Implement a public finance system based on New York City. It works well in New York City. It'll work well in New York State. Do you think he's serious? I do think he's serious. How will he prove he's serious? Well, he'll prove his seriousness by getting this bill passed in the, co in the coming legislature. Uh, campaign, he, I, I think we can have confidence that the governor will be able to pass something that is called campaign finance reform in this state. The real test and measure is going to be whether it includes the citizen funding. Mm -hmm. How would public funding work? Well, it can work a lot of different ways. The, we're, uh, for obvious reasons, it's, it's most useful to point to New York City when you're in New York State. Um, here we have a system uh, in the city, if you're running for citywide office or for city council, any contribution up to, you qualify to get into the system, you elect to be in a system, it's voluntary, then any contribution up to $175 is matched six to one. By the public. By the public. Out of a pool from the general fund from the budget. Uh, and that has had a dramatic transformative effect in the way that funds are raised. How so? First of all, the, the level of small donation, uh, the Campaign Finance Institute and the Brennan Center have done some great research and, and produced some beautiful maps showing the difference in the two systems. Uh, if you look at a map of uh, state assembly races in New York City and how many small contributions there are for those races, there are almost none throughout the entire city. Look at the same map of New York City uh, for city council races, it's covered. There are small contributions coming from every neighborhood, even the poorest neighborhoods in the city. People who are running for office are, are reaching out to their constituents, ordinary citizens. They're having house parties uh, in people's living rooms, not large, con you know, large uh, check uh, fundraisers. Um, and, and the statistics are that the people who participate in the system get the majority of their funding from small contributors and only a small minority of what, you've, what are still large contributions of, you know, $1,000 and up. This is a gigantic change. I mean, people should appreciate who gets to run for office when you have a system like this. Librarians run for office. Ex-teachers run for office. It's not just uh, people who have a Rolodex of prospective donors who get to run for office. And it's good for the candidates and the voters alike. You can, there's a lot of middle class and working class people who can, write, who can put that 10 and 20 and 50 dollars together. But that's worth 70 or 140 or 350 dollars to the candidate. So it makes a house party with 30 people at which you raise a thousand dollars, which takes a couple of hours. It's worth seven thousand dollars. That's a real thing that the candidate can then use because we actually need money to run campaigns. They have to have mailers and staff and so on. So if I, if I were to run for the city council or some other office in New York City and I announce that I'm going to enter this system correct, and, and, and I get you to give me how much? $40. And if you give me $40, what happens? Then the city fund gives you $240 on top of that. So that's a $280 contribution. That's a big contribution and it means me as a voter, I have a little skin in the game and I'm going to pay attention to you. So it totally changes kind of the relationship um, between the candidate and the donor, that a lot of small donors, and also we, you know, we favor people putting a little money in. We don't, if you can't go out, if you're running for office and you yeah. can't find three or four hundred people to give you twenty bucks, you have no business running for office. So we're not looking for, it's, it's a little bit of private money and then some public money, but then you don't have to just spend your time as an elected official should you win, in the unlikely event that you win. <laughs> uh, you, you then don't have to spend your time mostly worrying about how to get those $2,000 and $3,000 checks. But public funding did not stop Mike Bloomberg from spending a small fortune, large a, fortune. a large fortune, on his three elections. That's true. But it did allow his opponent to run a credible campaign, and the, and the election was pretty darn close. Using public funding, his Using opponent. public funding. So if you look across the country, there's, there's all sorts of evidence of people who spent a lot of money on campaigns, who spent more money than their opponents, and lost. Because having more money and having a lot of money doesn't make you a better candidate. What matters is having a threshold, an amount of money that's sufficient to run a credible campaign. 
And that's what citizen funding allows you to do. It allows you to get that amount of money that lets you run a credible campaign, be a good candidate, connecting with your voters, and do it in a way that's, that's focusing your attention on ordinary stuff. But how does it undo the power of big money? Well, so Mayor Bloomberg's an outlier. There aren't so many candidates like that. Um, listen, we're never going to keep private money out of politics. And that's the wrong ambition. The goal is to You're not saying we should. You, you, we shouldn't and we can't. Yeah, um, yeah that's right. Uh, well, Citizens United if, makes it impossible. They have opened the gates wide. And it was even before Citizens oh, United, yeah. as you're well aware, the gates were open pretty wide. Um, so the ambition isn't to keep private money out. It's to get enough public money in so that even when you have somebody who is not part of the system spending a lot, the other person it gets to a threshold that makes it reasonable, right? You don't, at some point, the extra money isn't that valuable. Uh, you just have to get to be competitive. And that's what we have found in the states and cities where you have public uh, and if citizen I could, If I could just add to that, I mean, it really is about reducing the influence of that money. And that, that takes of the two, big money. Of the big money. So th that takes two, p two pieces. One is create an alternative for candidates to run without reliance on the big money. The second is we need to have some genuine rules about what independent means. So when we talk about the super PACs, now it's, it's widely misunderstood. Super PACs are actually fully disclosed. We know where the money comes when it comes through a super PAC. As you were pointing out in your opening, there's money that flows into the super PACs that isn't disclosed. So that has to get dealt with. But those super PACs were a farce, right? You have candidates uh, endorsing them. You have candidates showing up at, uh, at fundraisers and then leaving before the, you know, before the money is asked for. You have uh, campaign staff, former campaign staff running them. We have no effective rules. This is all legal under what is considered coordination by the federal elections. Now Commission. we say a super PAC is okay if it's independent of the campaign, but in practice, in, in reality, in the in real world, it's not. it's not independent. Right. And so, and so that would reduce the influence and the appeal of those vehicles if they really were independent. We've had independent expenditure in campaigns really forever, but even dating back to the last big wave of campaign finance reform and the one before that, the, under the Buckley-Vallejo decision in 1976, uh, the Supreme Court said independent expenditures are okay, and those have been there for a long time. Now, we've crossed a different kind of threshold after Citizens United, both by allowing now corporate enterprise to get into the game, but also, I think, more importantly than the legal change, which actually wasn't as big as people uh, make out. But it change, it's a normative change. It's become an acceptable form of political engagement to, ha to be involved in a super PAC and, and, and dump large months, amounts of money independently into, or supposedly independently into campaigns. So we need to do both things. We need to actually have this separation so that candidates are at least arm's length from the outside groups, and we need to create an alternative. For I was involved in public funding in the early days, 20 years ago, and uh, the, so was this human foundation, which I headed then. And the common argument we ran into everywhere was, I, the voter, the taxpayer, doesn't want to fund the politician's sure. ambitions. Sure. Welfare for politicians. You yeah. Know, I don't want my tax dollars going to politicians. Listen, here's a, here's a good, smart thing they say. We have real problems in, in our state. We need money for schools. We shouldn't spend even uh, a modest amount of money on this election system of ours. And our view is that's, uh, you know, Penny wise and pound foolish, because if we don't do this, then people feed at the trough, the Verizons, the Goldman Sachs, other forces are able to get public money in a way that would not be possible, because we'll end up with people in office who are not beholden to them. And what will happen, and we have a clean election system, is that it will become a negative for candidates who don't participate over time. Uh, in the beginning, there'll be people on, in the system, some will be out of the system, that's okay, but we think we can create a kind of a norm in which people, it becomes a benefit to be part of a fair elections, a clean election system. I think what we're seeing, what we've seen consistently in polling, uh, is that voters are so disgusted with what they see in their politics that they're willing to consider an alternative and they're willing to pay for the, uh, they're willing to pay the costs of, uh, of funding their elections a different way. Is the New York model, the New York City model working? Do you think it's working effectively? Well, it's completely changing the way that, that uh, candidates run for election. It's opened up the opportunity for different sorts of folks to run for election, and it means that those who are running and succeeding in the system are getting there, are getting funded in their campaigns from sp small, principally from small contributors rather than big contributors. I think that means that you have the opportunity to have a degree of trust in your government in New York City that you don't have elsewhere in the country. 
I think it's been profoundly successful, right? There, there are always some problems with things, and no system, this is not some kind of magic feather that is gonna make democracy work uh, in all, you know, you still need good candidates with good ideas, uh, you need organizations keeping them honest, but if you can reduce this particular problem, which you led off with, the, the enormous uh, power that private money has, you'll get better outcomes, better rules, you get better outcomes. So th there's a, yes, it's working, I think. There was a local race here in New York for a state Senate seat. It got a lot of attention. Your candidate, supported by your super PAC and by your uh, Working Families Party, was Cecilia Katchett, right? She won by 18 votes with one recount after another. And many people are saying that this is a turning point in the fight to clean up state politics. Tell me about that. Well, for starters, she's now uh, potentially the 32nd vote in the uh, state Senate in favor of reform, 32 be, um, being a majority. But more importantly, this election was basically a referendum on her support for citizen funding as a part of campaign finance reform. She was for it and her opponent was against it. Exactly right. And it became the central issue over the last several weeks. I mean, Dan actually uh, called this an organizer's dream. This issue became central, and she won, as you said, by 18 votes after a long recount. Beating a millionaire incumbent. Beating uh, a millionaire assemblyman who was running up the food chain trying to take a Senate seat. And you it, think she won because she came out for the Absolutely, it animated, it animated. Uh, she thinks she won because she, uh, <laughs> because she ran on this issue. We have the ad that you oh, supported. Great. Let's take a look. In the Senate, George Amador means more pay-to-play corruption in Albany. Amador took tens of thousands of dollars from corporations and wealthy donors and opposed a tax increase on the rich. He voted against loans for small businesses, even opposed raising the minimum wage. And Cecilia Kachik? Kachik's a farmer, a school board member, and a mom. She'll fight for middle-class families and end pay-to-play politics in Albany by supporting fair elections that put us ahead of the special interests. Cecilia Kachik for Senate. Uh, her opponent was George Amador. He was a sitting assemblyman uh, from a, you know, from an adjacent uh, conjoined district. He then put out a half-hearted response and said he was for campaign finance reform, but only about disclosure. Um, and he, he did that, and then he attacked her on her support for citizen funding. That became, that's one of the reasons it became the central issue. Her name is uh, Cecilia, but goes by Cece, Cece Kachik. So Amador starts calling it the Cece tax. She wants to uh, uh, have a tax named after herself uh, that's going to cost everybody in the district money to pay for elections, to give money to politicians. That's sort of your worst nightmare when you're running a campaign. I've got a new tax named after me. She was forthright. She said, this is going to make our system better. Voters responded. Jonathan's super PAC supported her financially, but you put boots on the ground, didn't you? Sure. There were all, uh, an army of door knockers and phone bankers and volunteers uh, going door to door identifying voters and then turning them out on election day. This was just days after San Hurricane Sandy. Uh, roads were washed out. We had to have, uh, you know, uh, caravans trying to get people to the polls, people stationed at bridges that had been washed out, persuading them to go out of their way to vote, which I think produced that last 19 votes we needed. Uh, so I'll be ever grateful to the woman who did that. Um, you don't know what's going to win an election, so you do everything. You have to have the so-called air war, television, the ground game, uh, what working families and our allies did. Uh, you put it all together and sometimes when you have a good candidate who's willing to be forthright and then you have an opponent who decides, aha, I'm gonna kill her with this, it makes it, it's a perfect storm. Here's her opponent's ad. Shadowy New York City money groups calling themselves campaign finance reformers, spending hundreds of thousands on negative attacks, rewarding their candidates like C.C. Kachik who pushed their agenda. Taxpayer-funded political campaigns, which could cost us over $200 million per election. George Amador knows we already pay enough. He's worked to cut middle-class taxes to the lowest in decades, cap property taxes for families and seniors, and cut wasteful state spending. George Amador, standing up for us. That shadowy New York money, that's you. I think that's me, although I don't know which shadows I'm, I'm in. We were fully <laughs> but, disclosed and public about what we were doing. But here's the irony that I mentioned earlier. You started a super PAC last spring, Friends of Democracy, because you don't like super PACs, right? You want to get rid of super PACs. We, we were the first, uh, first to, uh, to recognize the irony, and we've got a lot of fun out of it. Um, we are the super PAC that, is, that, is, that has a mission of reducing the influence of money, money in politics. Who funds your super PAC? Uh, so I funded part of it, um, and then we raised uh, we raised about half of the money from other sources. Isn't it a little weird? You start a super PAC to 
defeat super PACs? Aren't you escalating? Aren't you proving, in effect, that it takes a super PAC to win, and therefore you're escalating the arms race? So again, I, I, it's a serious question. I think there, there are a couple of uh, different points to make about it. So the first is, is uh, our objective is not to force the private money out of politics. As, as Dan mentioned earlier, you can't as a constitutional matter, and as a practical matter, you right. can't. Even if the constitutional regime changed, money will find a way in, into politics. It really is the focus is about reducing the influence of money. And again, that comes from first separating the money from candidates so that if you're going to have independent expenditure, it is truly independent. Real rules around complete disclosure so that the, the dark money that you referenced in your opening isn't dark anymore. It sees the light of day. Uh, real and, 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 and functional enforcement. The Federal Election Commission uh, it, uh, is designed for inaction and incapacity. It is, it is by mandate three Republicans and three Democrats um, and they require a majority to do anything, to either make a rule or do <laughs> enforcement. So that means they can do the little things, but anything that has real meaning. And then obviously the thing we've been talking about, citizen funding. The other thing I'd make about related to our iron, irony we weren't outspending anybody, right? We spent in the aggregate about two and a half million dollars across eight congressional races and, and this, uh, this race in, in New York State. These are races, in some, in some cases, 12 million, 10 or 12 million dollars were being spent when you include all the inside and outside money. So we weren't outspending anybody. What we were doing was we were lifting up an issue that was otherwise, that differentiated the candidates that otherwise was going to be ignored creating the opportunity for that to then be engaged in the actual debate between the two candidates. Um, and what we saw was that when that issue gets debated and engaged, the candidate who is supporting reform and particularly reporting, supporting citizen-funded elections tends to win. But in the aggregate, George Amador and his allies outspent everybody else on the other side. He had more money to spend in that election and he still lost. Which proves the earlier point. It's not about, you don't have to match the other side dollar for dollar. You have to have enough to, to be credible. And that's why you want to have a citizen funding system with this private public uh, match uh, at some multiple that gives people who would never ever think of running for office a way into the game. You get people who come out of a history of service and commitment to a community group, to a union, to some kind of consumer organization, and they say to themselves, and we say to them, you should consider running for office, and it would never be possible. And you see the light go on saying, maybe I can. I know 400 people. I've been working in this community for 15 years. So that's what becomes possible under this kind of system. Your super PAC didn't just support this Senate race in New York. You supported how many congressional races around the country? We were heavily involved in eight congressional races around the country. And your candidates won how many of them? Seven out of eight. There was one, you ran an ad against Charlie Bass, the Republican in New Hampshire uh, last fall. Let's take a look at that ad. Another sellout crowd at the ballpark today. Those seats are taken. Do you feel frozen out like this when it comes to Congress? No wonder. Corporate lobbyists have your congressman's full attention. Sorry, those seats are paid for too. Your congressman, Charlie Bass, took over $166,000 from Big Oil and voted to give them billions in taxpayer subsidies. If we don't vote against Charlie Bass, middle class families will never get in the game. Those seats are taken! Friends of Democracy is responsible for the contents of this advertising. That is the message that we're trying to send. Now our view is that there is a suite of reforms that, that, are, that can be comprehensive and, and really meaningful and that a sitting politician is not going to elect the, uh, is not going to enact those reforms unless they believe it, uh, unless they believe that their election depends on it. So we're trying to send a message that being on the wrong side of the reform in a close election can cost you your election. Now, public financing has actually happened in several states. Maine enacted it some years ago for state races. Massachusetts enacted it by a 60 to 65 percent vote of the public, but then the Democratic legislature refused to fund it and eventually killed it. Arizona has it and it's been, it, yeah, it's, and Connecticut has it, but it's been in, involved in one court case after another in Arizona. Do you think ultimately, if it gets to the Supreme Court, the Citizens United Court would uphold it? The Supreme Court has so far not had a problem with, the, with citizen funding uh, as a concept. What they, what they threw out in the Arizona case, unfortunately, was the idea that they could trigger additional funds. So if you're in the system and, a, and a, either a self-funding candidate or an independent group was spending a lot of money against you, you would get more money than right. you would otherwise. 
um, and they decided that that somehow was chilling the speech of the independent person, um, and so they so they prohibit it. It makes it harder. It means we have to design a different. We have to uh, think about different ways to design a citizen-funded system um, to make it more robust and and be able to respond when there is large independent money being spent on the outside. But there's no problem with the constitutionality of, of a citizen-funded system whatsoever. It, has it been tested? It's been tested. It's been tested uh, in, in that, you know. It's voluntary, so you're not yeah. requiring people to jump in. But if they jump in, they have to abide by certain limits and rules. And it seems to be pretty successful it, where it's been. It's been, been tested dating back to the public financing system that existed for the, and still exists technically for the presidential races. Do you think this could ever become a player in the national field? I, I think that what happens here in New York is extremely important for exactly that reason. I mean, first, as Dan said earlier, this will be the first significant response to Citizens United, the first forward step since that massive step backwards. So that in, in itself sets a great example. But New York is an example for the nation in, in many ways. The governor, it's been speculated, has some ambitions for 2016. This would truly differentiate him in, a, in an otherwise leaderless field around this issue. He'll be bringing this, if he succeeds, trumpeting it in the, in the primaries in 2016 as, as an accomplishment and challenging his other, uh, the other candidates to, uh, to take similar stands. And it sets an example for other states then to enact similar reforms and eventually for the federal government. You said recently that money only matters up to a point. How so? Well, consider the presidential election. You mentioned a billion, a north of a billion dollars spent on each side. Would Barack Obama have won re-election if he had $100 million less, if he had $200 million less? Probably. There's some amount of money that it was going to require him to run a robust, credible campaign for president. And beyond that, the, to use the economic term, the diminishing marginal returns of additional money is extraordinary that after a point, the spending is just going to the wind. Were you disappointed that in his State of the Union speech, there was no reference to Citizens United, no reference to public funding, no reference to campaign finance reform? And I know that polls show that when people say those words, campaign finance reform, eyes glaze over. But he was silent on this subject at a critical moment. Listen, the reason we have to focus on doing this at the state level is the system is blocked in Washington. Uh, to any meaningful uh, effort. So that's why we have to succeed in New York and some other states, and that will open things up. Um, I think the president has decided that this is not, this dog is not going to hunt. I was disappointed that it wasn't a speech, but not surprised. Yeah. Um, you know, the pre and, and the president has decided instead to focus on other incredibly important issues uh, regarding failures in our democracy and the way that people vote, and that's important as well. But the, the president has missed a number of opportunities to show leadership on this issue, and I, I think that's been both unfortunate and a bad choice politically for him. I'd say the biggest obstacle that we face is actually just the, the enormous cynicism that, that citizens have about their government. They, they have a hard time believing that there's a way to do this um, that actually would create a system where their, their representatives are really working for them. That's a real obstacle. And I would add, we don't talk about campaign finance reform. We talk about corruption. That's what this system is, right? And people know it. And the, the data on this is enormous. When you describe to people the current system and say this is an alternative, you get super majorities in favor of it. So part of this is we have to have a good message. We have to be uh, relentless about promoting it. You've got to look for opportunities like this Senate race, like these congressional races, where you can turn an election into a referendum on this unusual but unbelievably important topic and we'll win more than we lose. Elected officials, while they're nervous about changing the system under which they have themselves thrived, once in office, they like this because a lot of people go into public service for a good reason. They don't, want, they don't enjoy going to the lobbyist fundraisers or dialing for dollars any more than a normal human being would. So this is an opportunity for them to get off of that, that hamster wheel and r remind themselves of why they got into this to begin with, which is to help solve actually important problems. Can we really, though, put the genie back in the bottle when everyone these days is rubbing that bottle? The answer is we can't know for sure. We've, there's so much money being spent and there's so much cynicism about the system. But the evidence shows in the states that do have public financing systems, the evidence shows that candidates can run into those systems and win, and they do it by focusing on their constituents and small donors. Somebody who gives $10 to a campaign 
they're more likely to show up and volunteer, they're more likely to show up and vote, they're more likely to follow what happens. And so that engage, having a system where candidates can spend their time engaging with their constituents directly is, gonna, is going to be what, part of what allows the big money to have a reduced influence. The electoral moment is the moment in our society where people pause for a minute, not for very long, but they do pause, and we, we get to answer the question, ask and answer the question, how are we doing? Our view is we're not doing as well as we should, and this is one of the reasons why. Bob Dylan's famous phrase, money doesn't talk, it swears. So we're trying to turn down the ability of money to control things, we're not getting rid of it, but so somehow, for some reason, in this moment, it seems to have finally penetrated public consciousness. They know the system is corrupt, and they want to have some confidence. Not everybody, but enough people want to have some confidence that we can do better. Jonathan Soros, Dan Cantor, we'll be watching what happens. Thank you very much for this very informative discussion. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for having us.